Okay, well today I got to we're going to be talking about the, the history and the development of cultural psychiatry in general. Uh, so my plan for this is first of all I'll give you a bit of theory as we talk now. Then I'll give you a list of some books which I should have given you before but haven't done. And then I'll show, go over the whole material again, showing some sides of some exotic culture bound syndromes around the world. This is no single book on the history of cultural psychiatry. It's just bits and pieces here and there. Uh, the paper you've, you've given out for them, one called Psychiatry's Culture. So there are bits and pieces around uh, the world on that, but there's no single book on history of cultural psychiatry. Now, look at the, how long do we have for this? I'm not sure. We've got four hours all yeah, together. Yeah. A bit, a bit of break, so maybe we'll have a break whenever you're ready. We can have a couple of breaks during the morning. Oh, uh, well, so somewhat. Well, well, I'll carry on talking for somewhere half an hour. And perhaps we can have a discussion. Yeah, yeah. So you should kind of a bit. Uh, it's so few of us. I mean, you interrupt yeah. me say, I don't agree with what you're saying. I don't yeah. understand what you're saying, or whatever. So feel free to stop me at any point. In fact, it would be easier for me if you stop me and let me carry on. <laughs> Coffee is very good, by the way. <laughs> okay, doctors and uh, medical specialists throughout history have often commented on national characteristics. That goes back to the Greeks and so on. So we can find mentions in the Hippocratic Corpus, which is classical Greece in the um, fourth century before Christ. <coughs> or as we say these days, before the Common Era, BC was replaced by BC, before the Common Era. <coughs> and there are often mentions of national characteristics of certain ethnic groups or other nations, such as the Persians, the Greeks were trying to understand, who had certain characteristics. We find through the whole history of uh, cultural psychiatry, the national personality and national audiences go together. The national audiences are seen as extensions of the normal national personality, which is seen as differing in different societies. Well, I'll just give you odd examples from the classical medieval period. Uh, start with the 18th century in Europe, the point at which psychiatry really started uh, forming out of medicine as a separate district. Psychiatry is seen as originating in the late 18th century. The work of Esquirol, uh, the freedom of the lunatics in the Salpetriere uh, after the French Revolution, and then consolidated itself as a separate subspeciality. Okay, in 1735, an English uh, doctor, as well as J.P., the no psychiatrist at that time, wrote a book called The English Malady. It's called Chain CH. E Y N E. I forgot his first name. George Chain, Henry Chain. Wait a moment. Chain. No, it's Jeffrey. No. Who's with G anyway? So G Chain. Certainly. Uh, so I don't know his first name. His initial G anyway. Um, he wrote the English, the English nation, but took his susceptible to suicide and misery. Okay? And that's what he called the English malady. There's a whole book just on English personality arguing that the, the nation was related to a particular per personality characteristics and particular type of disease. Now he called that depression melancholy, which is an old term coming from Greek science, uh, from the Hippocratic Corpus in Greek popular medicine, doesn't quite mean the same as depression. In fact, until a few years ago there was um, a category in uh, the early DSMs which argued for um, 
my individual American career, which is all the depression people got as they got older. But it doesn't quite mean the same as uh, depression. And cultural psychiatrists like me argue for it uh, being uh, fairly non-specific. You can't easily equate categories which seem to be the same across cultures and across time as being exactly the same thing. That's one of the big lessons that comes out of cultural psychiatry. So then the medieval period had a category called melancholia, also had the categories called acedia, and so we can't assume that is the same as depression. It's a relationship to depression, but we can't assume that illnesses are universal and hence biologically justified uh, throughout history. Well, okay, Chain argues that there are a lot of factors contributing to this English misery, the English malady. First one said it's the weather, the fog, the cold, the wet, that makes everything miserable, okay? Second one was the diet, and he blamed the roast beef. And the third thing was the fast pace of economic life. But at that time being one of the first capitalist societies, people buying shares, um, a new stock exchange starting up, everybody thinking about economic possibilities and getting ahead. So people are ambitious. So the ambition combined with eating beef and combined with the fog makes you permanently anxious. You wonder, uh, will my shares go up in value or will they go down? And so you become generally depressed. And the more extreme examples of that uh, were depressive illness. And similar things, I also quote in this paper, the Italian humanist uh, writer Julius Skyger, who in a poem in 1561, that's 200 years before Chain was writing, described the character of his uh, called companion, who was the Italian compatriots, as come to Torres Iris Torres Fatiosi in uh, Italian Latin. In other words, as being quarrelsome, has been um, facting or factitious. I like to form into little factions. I like to form into little groups who plot against each other and it's irresolute in personality. Okay, so the people who write about national characteristics in that sort of way, and we might feel not very scientific. In the late 18th century, many similar books linked to the new idea of culture, culture, and national character. And the word culture comes from our incest of plants, and as you see in my paper, it really comes out of the late, 19th, late 18th century German Romanticism, the Romantic movement. People like the Grimbers, people who um, uh, wrote the famous book um, summarizing German fairy tales, folklore, and all of that. And a German philosopher and historian called Gottfried Herder, H E R D E R. And this idea gave rise to the ideas of German nationality later on. Okay? So the idea is the culture, some of it like a plant, you culture plant, for instance. So the culture is that which helps the thing grow naturally. I plant my plant here in my pot, and it, I cultivate it, but I don't really need much to do to it, because it sort of grows naturally. Assuming that I've kept the temperature the same, assuming that I've water it and so on. So culture is is an attribute of nations, of a natural development in one direction or another. And of course, different nations would have different cultures. And that sort of covers the idea of national character. In other words, the typical personality uh, preferred by a particular culture or um, um, propagated by a particular culture. So he's using Chain's example, all the English are to an extent depressed. But I mean, not clinically depressed, but they're feeling miserable, even in the fog, eating beef and worrying about their savings and so on. So ideas like culture, nation, and national character 
war ideas are developed together and then we react with each other so we can't easily separate them out. It's often associated with the idea of race or ACE which assumed that human beings had subspecies uh, which bred true. And the sort of um, terminology we use now, uh, which, uh, which I hate and which I always argue against, comes from a German called Johannes Blumenbach, B-L-O-O-M-E-N-B-A-C-H, who wrote in the middle 18th century from the Bible, this is of course before the phase of evolution, Remember Norman Noah's Ark runs on Mount Ararat, they live the distant parts from the Ark, the animals get out, and those three sons get out, and they go in different directions. A broom bark argued that the descendants of Noah's three sons gave rise to the three main races. And one lot went north towards the Caucasian mountains, and they, they were the ancestors of the so-called Caucasian people. Now the word Caucasian we still use, so you often find it on blood forms you fill in, and you find it in uh, articles in the BJ Psych and so on. It's a shorthand for white European. Scientifically, it means nothing. In fact, uh, the whites don't come from the Caucasus Mountains, we come from further north in terms of origin. So. Okay, so Caucasian is quite an inaccurate term, it's pseudo-scientific. What we're just talking about is a group of people who seem to be vaguely European origin. I far prefer people to put European or white uh, for that. Now, Boombard's other two characters, uh, sorry, other two races, uh, were, if I remember... Um oh, sorry, another thing about Caucasian. It's also related to language. So sometimes he created with the Indo-European, in other words, people who speak Sanskrit-derived languages uh, which originated in the western part of Central Asia. So the Persian was an Indo-European language, Sanskrit is uh, what became Hindi in the modern India, and so on. And of course all European languages, with the exception of uh, uh, the Basque language, which origin in the quite notes. Because otherwise all those languages would descend from Sanskrit. If you studied Sanskrit, you would recognize certain verb endings, a certain style of, of grammar and so on, which would help you with any European language. So when I, a few years ago, my last field area was, well, I worked in Albania, just north of Greece, and I had to learn the Albanian language there. And besides that, the little Sanskrit in India, I was very familiar with some of the, the word endings. It wasn't quite as perplexing as it might have been. And also you find similar thing roots in, in the Latin, Greek, uh, Teutonic languages, and the Slavonic languages as well. English, of course, is a Teutonic language, one derived from uh, early forms of German. However, um, so getting back to uh, Bruin Bach and his, uh, his three groups. I come in the uh, two races he chose. So the Caucasians were supposedly taught in the European and they come from the Caucasus Mountains. Um, no group we must have picked the Africans and the other one, maybe the Semitic races, I don't know. Okay. Um, that generally expanded into a variable schema, probably most common in the 19th century was four or five races. But the general feeling now is the whole thing is so unscientific that there's uh, no point in arguing about different races. It's the overlap between groups is much bigger than the, the purity of each subgroup is. So your the ends the enzymes you have to uh, uh, in biochemistry would overlap with the isoenzymes would overlap with those of another group one they hold consistent within your own group. So in a sense there is no breeding tree with human beings. We're all generally mixed up. Also obviously we share common ancestors to some extent. That's probably only in the last uh, millennium or so. If we go back more than 5,000 years, probably all come from the same stock. 
There's no point in talking about racism, except in a sociological context, we should talk about racism and prejudice, which um, certain groups would have uh, uh, for each other. But we still find similar ideas persisting now in politics for certain groups. Found within them, for instance, among Hindu nationalists in India with the idea of Hindutva, the idea that Hinduism is a religion that has gone with some substantial biology which may remain, uh, which uh, be true. Similar ideas among the Sinhalese nationalists in Sri Lanka, somehow their biology be more pure than the Tamils in the north of Sri Lanka. And again, country what's concerned in uh, of course, and concerned the obviously the Hungarian ideas of keeping out uh, ethnic minorities, uh, particularly from Syria and from Libya, which is going on in the present time. The Hungarian government, which is quite a right wing government, is arguing that the Hungarians are somehow pure uh, Europeans and so they will get contaminated with these uh, Arabs and so on. Which is a curious idea actually, because Hungary. It's really uh, uh, a separate group in the, in European terms and the Hungarians come originally from the, the Arctic somewhere. Hungarians and Finns, although the countries are wide apart, have a very similar language, which is totally, <coughs> <coughs> totally different from uh, the other Indo-Europeans. It's not actually in the European language. What are they the Vikings? I fear not. No, Vikings are okay. <laughs> the Vikings are Teutons. Uh, so they're just a German speaking group. So okay. there'll be Danes, Saxons. Mm. Well, actually, Saxons weren't Vikings. Vikings would come from Norway, Sweden. What's now Norway, Sweden? Um, Denmark. Uh, Denmark, mm. uh, Iceland, and no, the great times. The Finns in Finland probably are too far away to become Vikings. Vikings are the people who, who attacked the English Anglo-Saxons from about 7th century AD onwards. No, they're, no more, they're more strange, more different. Vikings are okay. They speak a language similar to us. And of course we have their gods. And their days of the week in English are the names of Viking gods. Monday, the moon day, Tuesday named after Thor, today's what Wednesday, named after the god Woden, Thursday. It's like Tuesday is named after which, which Viking god is Tuesday named after? It's a female goddess, I've got the name. So it's Thursday's named after Thor. Friday's named after Freya, another goddess. Uh, Saturday are a different system from the Roman Saturn, uh, another god, and Sunday named after the sun again. Mm. <coughs> but Hungarians, we don't have much contact with at all. But Hungarians will maintain that they're, they're properly in the European and that they need to retain their, their purity of biology and to keep out these Arabs and Muslims and so on. Again, an equation between biology and culture, which runs through the whole race side there. So always the confusion between what is cultural and what is biological. The problem with the race, of course, is that it's not only inaccurate, but it's used in and used to justify colonial and post-colonial expansion. The Tasmanians of Tasmania, the island of South Australia, wiped out by the whites in the 19th century on the basis of they were an inferior race and we've got many similar ideas elsewhere. For example, the new world slavery, slavery in the Americas. Initially when slavery started after uh, people of English origin settled in North America, the slaves were white. They were political rebels who were I Irish or Scottish so in the whole 17th century, slaves imported into America were white. Uh, but it was then found out they weren't very good at working, there weren't enough of them. So the big uh, cross-continental uh, uh, transfers 
of people having what's called the middle passage so that the European slavers would buy slaves in Africa, transport them over to America uh, and wherever they were enslaved. These people were obviously predominantly of African origin. There's no particular justification for them being black, but it's just that it's economically more convenient. There's no idea of racism in the days of early slavery. Just as um, we went to Africa and we, we found they were willing to sell us their, their fellows and we thought we could use them as slaves, so we bought them, not because we thought they were super inferior, but just because they were cheap and, and we could buy them. So slavery in the, in the Americas then starts with just as a matter of convenience. But in the late 18th century and early 19th century, a sentiment grew against slavery. Many people like the Quakers, a uh, religious organization, would be opposed to slavery. Many humanitarians would object to the, And of course, there were occasional slavery revolts which simulated the, the Europeans to think that maybe there was something wrong going on. At that time, the, the, particularly the Americans, and uh, making medical profession, started justifying slavery in biological and in medical terms. And from the 1820s and 1830s onwards, endless articles in uh, medical journals of the southern United States justifying slavery. And so the people of African origin had an inferior biology, they were less intelligent, they were uh, stimulated more by sexual and bodily functions, and other races, and it can also work harder and be generally tougher. So, something more like an animal in terms of uh, human conceptions. Then this article is on this. Some of the often post mortem studies. If you read my book, Aliens and Aliens, there's so many examples in there of papers written in the uh, American medical journals of the 1830s, which discuss post mortem studies and we show, or purport to show, that black people's brains when dissected have different levels of development in the, in the cerebrum. Remember there are five layers in the cerebrum? We're getting your closest biology now. And so those layers are associated with um, uh, appetite? Help me on this. Yeah. You must know more than I do. I forgot mm -hmm. all this. But, so those, those layers associated with bodily things were seen as more developed in Africans at least in these post-mortem studies. And studies like that only disappeared by in about, say, 1960. This is all very recent history. Again, okay, not only did that, they noticed the illnesses, cultural illnesses, which black, black slaves got. Famous examples of these are drapetomania. Shall I write these up, do you think? Hmm? Shall I write them up? If you want to, yes, uh, do you know kleptomania? Um, is that when they run away from? Yeah, they run away. Okay. Drapetomania, okay. These this will desire to escape from the plantation. Which is cocaine concerned, white slavers argued, was a sort of mental illness. These poor Africans don't know what they're, uh, what they're in for. They want to escape from the paternalistic plantation where they're fed and they want to offer them so The drapetomania, the irresistible desire to run away from the plantation, which is seen as a form of a mania or uh, attention deficit disorder, I imagine, mm -hmm. in put it in modern terms. The category was dyssesthesia, Ethiopia, it basically means um, unpleasant sensation of the African. Ethiopia, the Latin for uh, sub Saharan Africans, Ethiopians. And that will be generally, mean a sort of bad temper or sloppiness, which these slaves, for some curious reason, manifest. They weren't happy being slaves. So therefore they had disease, and we call that dysesthesia aviopica, and she of course is good feeding, good care, a good whipping, and keeping them to the, to the job again. 
The last example of this particular sort of thinking was in 1953 when J.C. Carreras, who's an English colonial psychiatrist who works in Kenya, wrote a book for the World Health Organization called The African Mind in Health and Disease. And in this book, he argues, quoting the various Kenyan uh, post-mortem studies, the Africans have fewer brain cells, and the parts of the brain connected with physical and sexual issues are overdeveloped compared with Europeans, and therefore it was in their best interest that she came to a very simple level of non-educated work, uh, manual labor, and so on. I might notice similar arguments in psychology more generally in relation to gender. I've written very specifically on gender, or the one of my books touches on this. This is that is social Darwinism. You know about social Darwinism? It's a political application of Darwin's theories. Darwin, of course, has been politically on the left wing, he's very anti slavery, very anti race, but some of his ideas were picked up by uh, nationalists in Europe were known as social Darwinists, which argued that all races are in competition with each other and then the toughest and uh, most unkind will survive. And those ideas are supposed to be led to nationalism in the time of the First World War, and of course, are uh, more in the more developed sense, that is the Hitler and the Nazis later on. The social Darwinism, maybe the tough, the strongest will survive. Survival of the fittest, which of course wasn't a, a term used by Darwin. It's just the survival of the fittest. Who originated the term survival of the fittest? Is it Huxley? I'm, I'm shocking with the names. It was Darwin's colleague Huxley, he said it wasn't Darwin himself, or was it uh, Spencer? I the common phrase that weak races will disappear. It's very commonly believed by white colonists in Australia that the same Aboriginals will disappear. They were seen as biologically weak. So they would fail to reproduce lots of any children and just disappear. And some people say that also about Africans. No luck? Okay, well, it wasn't Darwin anyway, so I'm willing just to exclude Darwin from um, social Darwinism. Okay, cultural psychiatry is a separate division of psychiatry, though most fully in the 19th century. Herbert Spencer. In Spencer. Herbert okay. Spencer, yeah. Who was, of course, not a biologist, he was a critic and sociologist of Darwin's time. And use Darwin's ideas on evolution to justify social formations in a way which people don't do anymore. We feel it doesn't actually work. So the period of colonial expansion of the British Empire and the French Empire in the 19th century was associated with with the cultural psychiatry. So the Europeans had the problem of what do we do about things that look like illnesses in our societies? By that time, they sorted out the main classifications of disease in the patients they saw in the European asylums. So they went out in the colonies, they saw types of behavior that seemed bizarre or unusual, and they had to explain them. So do we try to squeeze them into the same European boxes, or do we allow an exception? We said they have their own particular boxes, which came to be called culture-bound syndromes. In other words, a diagnostic box that contained in the old certain was not found in Europe. Examples of, uh, I'll show you some slides of all of these in a moment. 
Again, in the market, Murray, Murray, uh, and the uh, Murray Archipelago, Singapore, Philippines, and so on. Pan Cordurata, that sort of um, Rata found again in the same area, characterised by um, excessive self reference. Eco layer imitating other people's speech, eco pressure imitating other's actions, and so on. And basically, in a sense of some sort of image of people who are hysterical, typically found among women. Nervous, very similar pattern found in the Latin America. Okay, this is the mainstream uh, psychology. I don't know, clearly not psychology is not interested in theory. Basically you had to lock up some of the natives who were causing trouble and make sure that there were scandals and that they didn't starve to death and were treated too brutally. But actually scientific work was very little done until Crapin went to Java. Emil Crapin, you know about the man who first distinguished uh, what we now call schizophrenia, he called it dementia precox, distinguished it for a man in depression or bipolarness in the period from about 1880 to 1900. In 1902 he went on trip to Java, uh, now part of Indonesia, at the time it was a Dutch colony, and thought he'd interview some of the patients are uh, in, uh, in the hospital there, some of the local Javanese patients. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this, other than a uh, metropolitan psychiatrist will bother to get to the colonies and look for uh, uh, patterns of illness. And uh, metropolitan colonial officials would issue um, either reports done by the local doctors, which generally have low status. It's a very low status job to go to Africa and um, be a psychiatrist. Normally, an army medical officer, I did it part time as part of what they did. We found there were a few full time uh, colonial psychiatrists in the British Empire in the, uh, um, until about 1900. I guess possibly less than five for the whole empire, including India, Africa, and so on. So, this is a bum job of various status the European who adopted and they were not very research orientated or scientifically oriented. Okay, well Kropin said that yes, if we squeeze the local orders, we can put it into a European box. Uh, I'll demonstrate this graphically in the slides. So most cases of uh, a mock uh, will probably be the same as European uh, schizophrenia. Okay, some of them would be the uh, same as European mania, but the local form it takes is that of a mock, in other words, indiscriminate mass homicide directed against neighbours and others. And psychiatrists then use the things to inform and content, which you probably still use now in world rounds, uh, in which the form is the superficial, the cultural, the individual, uh, the transient, related to the personality, of no significance diagnostically. Whilst the form is the underlying biology, or assumed underlying biology, of course in the psychosis we don't know what the underlying biology is at all, but it's an article of faith that we will eventually find it out, as Kraepin said we would. It's supposedly the form that determines the diagnosis. The table on Kraepin's patients, uh, he had what we would now say uh, had uh, hypermanic delusions, grandiose delusions, and he said he was he was uh, the Kaiser, the German Emperor. Another patient with the same problem might said that he was the French Emperor Napoleon. But Kraepin tells us that to say you're Napoleon or the Kaiser is of no significance at all. What is important is the underlying form, the grandiose identification, or its identification with some figure who's of greater importance. So the form is supposedly the biological, 
and Savona gives rise to to uh, universality and to the actual disease. Problem is that the, with the psychosis we can't easily separate the form from the content. It's just an article of faith, you know, on the board that our consultant says to us, okay, that's the content, but tell me what's the form of the illness, and we go for more psychopathological descriptions, like uh, uh, in the case I just mentioned, grandiose identification, the pants of hallucinations and so on. But the actual personality of the people who identify with or mistake for one for the other, this is seen as, as uh, the content. So that's cultural data, um, supposedly of no significant uh, interest to the psychiatrist. But as article of faith, which I would probably quarrel with, However, there's a competing type of thing came up in by the early uh, 20th century, which is that of, of psychoanalysis. So back to the alternative phase in the early 20th century. You've got this very medical approach, asylum-based, diagnostic uh, types and so on. But it's a competing system of psychiatry come at the same time. It's like the psychoanalysis, it's my model of psychoanalysis, okay? So from the unconscious, so it's, it's the model of a human mind, it's like a job, okay? So unconscious feelings, urges, emotions and so on, constantly seek to be expressed, okay? Sexual instincts, appetite, anger and so on. There is unconscious, the UCS is the normal abbreviation for the unconscious. These things are seeking to pop out of your unconscious the whole time, okay? But they're depressed. But conscious thoughts are not so conscious thoughts, which Freud later said they were represented by what he called the superego. Ego, uh, and, uh, Superego systems differ from conscious to unconscious, but just for the time being, don't worry about it. So the unconscious sexual feelings come out, but society says, hey, um, you can't have sex with everybody, you can't eat whatever you want to eat, you've got to behave yourself, you've got to conform and so on. So human beings caught between these two, it's a very simplified form, okay? And all these odds from the middle, are compromised formations of different sorts, which may be symptoms, uh, may be dreams, uh, may be unconscious jokes, what Freud called parapraxis, in other words, um, uh, physical uh, mishaps which symbolize the particular problem. All these three and all these four are the same, okay? Parapraxis, that is. Okay, so symptoms are no more significant than dreams. They're both manufactured in exactly the same way. So when psychiatrists got interested in the cultural difference in different illnesses, we're interested in how much the, the conscious social manifestations, social pressures that are done at the top actually affect, affect the development of the child. Particularly in relation to things like weaning. Okay? An example that would be famous culture by saying the Windy Girl or Witty Girl Syndrome, which is seen as a sort of cannibalistic compulsion by the Jiba Indians of North America, the United States and Canada. It seemed to be related to too abrupt weaning. The young Ojibwa baby is uh, fed from his mother's breast, he gets milk and so on. Then weaning time comes, because maybe there's another baby along the way who won the mother's, the same mother's milk. And the child at that time is torn from the breast and soon they do eat a totally adult diet. That severe separation from the breast 
is seen as quite traumatic, or was seen as traumatic by the psychoanalysts. Then besides weaning quite a lot as a con contribution to the human personality. The little Ojibwa boy grows up with a sort of cannibalistic compulsion. He wants to devour things, okay? And so he's haunted by the nightmare of a windy girl monster who is a cannibalistic monster which seeks to eat him. Okay. Similar explanations were used by this I talk at other things. Rata do I need to write this up? Well, you've got written in the paper. You've got to in the paper. Well, also, the Ikele, the Kapracha, the also the, the, Ikure, Kapracha, pardon, I described in the Indonesian, the Philippines, is related to a uh, male uh, achievement of women, the, of a gender oppressing them. How uh, repressing them. And so they become subordinate, uh, excessively conscientious, unwilling to uh, confront men and so on. But their response is a passive response, quite passive aggressive if you want, which they imitate men's behaviour. So the angry man says to the woman, you stupid woman, and she says, stupid woman, and he says, I hate you, you bitch, uh, and she says, you bitch. So that's in other words, that's Ikulea, in the medical terminology, which you repeat the, uh, what other people say to you. So the unconscious psycho who read the voice, read this actually, uh, the only way she can get back at her husband, okay? In a sense, making fun of him by saying, oh, silly, silly me, stupid me, and so on. In a way, uh, sometimes described in, uh, for North American slaves, they give you an example of that same sort of response. So the white slave owner gets one of his slaves to walk off his favourite horse. So when the, when the owner's out of sight, the slave makes the horse fall down and injure itself. So the owner comes back and says, you stupid slave, I, I left you walking off this precious horse and he have damaged it, you stupid idiot. And the slave says, sorry master, me a stupid idiot. But inside he's thinking, aha, I've got him here, I damaged his bloody horse for him. So that sort of unconscious uh, getting back to people was argued by psychoanalysts to be common in culture bound syndromes. Another one was um, Arctic hysteria, as the whites called it. This is what you get in your kayak in along in your canoe and the whole city is just a flat sea, perfectly calm, perfectly quiet, the sun's reflected on the ice, and you get into a sort of hysterical state. And now seen as, as actually very environmental. It was the stillness of the Arctic landscape that gave people hysteria. Okay. Some psychiatrists worked in Africa, a few particularly Swiss and the French, and they developed psychodynamic views of local owners, usually in relation to either the weaning or the famous Oedipus complex. I'm sure you know about the Oedipus complex, it's a rivalry in which the developing boy or girl are, I guess, the opposite sex parent with whom they have been. Uh, sorry, same-sex parent, with whom they compete in for the affection of the opposite sex parent. So the young boy wants to love his mother and sees his father as a competitor and compromise for females. In 1912, Floyd wrote a quite famous book called Totem and Taboo. For the world always been very interested in anthropology and history and so to incorporate that into psychological thinking. And he tried to give a, a, a explanation of the, for the origin of the Oedipus complex. Now his story, which he called the myth, a sort of folk story, possible, what we now call a just so story, the sort of biological anthropologists often offer for the evolutionary origin of certain um, human, modern human potentials. You can't prove that's the origin, but you just do a, 
her style may or may not be useful. So Freud starts by taking some ideas from Darwin, which says that um, uh, primitive human beings, hominids, proto-humans, uh, had a pack-like form, and they were dominated by a uh, sort of senior male who controlled them totally, okay? Uh, okay, so some of you are like a chimpanzee, not gorillas, of course, gorillas are always seen as the most animal-like of uh, a pack-like of uh, primates, of course, uh, uh, gorillas actually have uh, pain, male, female pain, unlike chimps so much more like to be part of, of a tube. So well, using the tube model, Freud says early human beings were dominated by the old man. He's the biggest old man, he would beat the shit out of the, the younger males in his tube, and he had all the women, to, all the females, to himself. So sisters, uh, daughters, mothers, uh, he had sex with all of them. Eventually, the, young, the younger males got jealous of him, and as he got weaker and older, uh, they decided to kill him. So they kill him, and then in a rather curious episode, they're overcome by grief and guilt, because they loved the old man, or they hated him at the same time. So they institute um, the totemic meal. Totem is um, in anthropology is uh, normal animal, sometimes a plant or sometimes some other substance which has special significance for a particular group. And often there are regulations that you, you can't eat it if you're a member of that group. So if I'm a member of the Wallaby uh, clan, so my lot we Wallabies don't eat Wallabies, but you're a member of the Crocodile clan, can eat uh, in the Wobbies. No, I, I can eat crocodiles and you can't, okay? So you won't tell me you don't eat. Oh, it's not a lot of simplistic understanding. Unfortunately, yesterday the dead father killed by the by the primal horde is actually commemorated as a totem. So he's, he's not uh, killed or eaten in effigy again. In fact, you avoid eating the the totemic animal which represents the father, okay? So we are doing my, the father who I killed, so I could get access to all the women, is identified with the Wallaby. So when my, my clan are called the Wallabies, and we don't eat the Wallabies, we feel rather well bad about that, because they represent our, the father we killed. At the same time, the incest taboo for it said, is introduced, so you don't have sexual relations, with close kin. Now, just in parenthesis, there's another explanation in anthropology about the incest avoidance. Uh, one which I would argue myself, I, I wouldn't agree with Freud. I assume most people that um, incest uh, uh, avoidance is a socially instituted fact. I use a biological tendency to avoid the incest. There are a lot of evidence from primates and rats, not in the whole area. Our mammals don't have um, uh, have sex with their close relatives. So it's nothing to do with sexual understanding. It's a biological fact. It's called Westermark hypothesis. That's very tangential anyway. Uh, okay, so for his ideas, incest is avoided, uh, the totem is introduced, and certain things are tabooed by the totem. And each generation, the memory of this ancestral cain appears again and again as the Oedipus complex. But actually, Freud's idea in 1912 was not greatly criticised by anthropologists, but on the whole didn't really have much um, influence on them, except in the United States, where psychoanalysis became a lot more popular as a, as a general discipline, and certainly among social scientists. Was the period in the early 1950s when every anthropologist almost had to have a psychoanalysis to be a proper uh, anthropologist. In other words, to understand their own motivations and those of other people. That never happened in Europe, so it didn't happen in Britain. All the whole anthropologists had kept very 
distant from uh, psychiatrists with some exceptions. So Macon and Spodgy influenced by psychoanalysis and the rapprochement between anthropology and psychiatry. And that uh, was called the Culture and Personality School. It emphasized particularly the, person, the personalities which are found in the particular culture. So C and P face an argument what they called an arc of culture. It was an arc of all the potential things human beings can possibly do. So in relation to say which part of accusations, now a society that's totally paranoid, totally terrified by which is trying to take over and the woman from which is everywhere a very fearful sort of society. On the opposite end of that arc, how people don't care about witchcraft at all. I so said maybe we could argue modern uh, European society, unless you assume that certain things are occurring to witchcraft in our own society. What happens is that um, in that society, the most paranoid people would gravitate towards the cultural norm, i.e. have witchcraft paranoia more easily in the societies. In Isaiah is associated with the uh, American anthropologist called Ruth Benedict, who had a famous book called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword about Japanese national characteristics during the Second World War. It's funded by the CIA. CIA funded the author of anthropology in the 40s and the 50s on the basis of this sort of cultural knowledge would help you outweigh the enemy. So in the 40s of uh, Second World War, Basically, sons of Japanese and sons of Germans and progressive sons of Russians in the, in the 1950s. So a famous study along these lines was done in about 1954 by Jeffrey Gora, an in, in English anthropologist who was also a psychiatrist. His book was called The People of Great Russia. And the argument that traditional Russian Practices of kind children, this sort of papoose on the back, and I don't know what the Russians call it. We pack up the baby so you can hardly move, and it's sort of sausage, and you sing it on your back, and you carry the baby around like that. Mm -hmm. The babushka would carry it. What it's called, I don't actually you know. So, go argues this makes for the Russian and national characteristic. As a young baby, you learn if you're tied up, so you can't move, but you get fed at intervals. So you learn that you keep quiet, and you can't misbehave because you can't move anyway. Everything will turn out okay. Which makes for a very, uh, uh, what's the word, more complacent? Submissive. What? Not submissive. Yeah, a very passive population anyway, who always do what you say. So when the leader is a Tsar or the Tsar, you do the same thing, you shut up and you keep quiet. And so Gorish argues that is the Russian national character. And we can argue all this is rather sloppy sort of a, a anthropology. And maybe we should use questionnaires or so more, more detailed studies of obedience to authority in a particular culture. A person working on these lines is Gregory Bateson. You might have read his book, um, Step Swords and Encourage Your Mind. Bates argued for similar phrases in relation to the origins of schizophrenia and the idea of what called, he called schismogenesis, where in which he unified society and started developing a uh, conflict between subcomponents. On the whole, these stuff sides are concerned it with the personality phase in a particular culture rather than particular <coughs> individuals with mental illness. But it's the idea that the pathology is just a cultural personality writ large. <coughs> okay, it's cultural personality studies. It became less fashionable in the early 1960s and more has disappeared. I mean, the appraisal of anthropology by 
was called Psycho Joanne to Boyden. And when the sounds of Boyden would work in what we once were called Psychology. Now, at the same time, the more empirical studies of the Cape and Time sort was continued in general psychiatry. And many psychiatrists, of course, were not psychiatrists. And, uh, for instance, Boyden had noted that travellers, missionaries, colonial officials and so on had said they didn't seem anything like mental illness in small scale, sim technologically simple societies, a sort which were colonised by the Europeans. So the World Health Organization in the 1950s uh, wondered if schizophrenia was a universal panel or not. As the world is coming out of American psychiatry, such as schizophrenic manner, the uh, of manner's actions uh, in Western societies gave rise to schizophrenia in children, or skewed family relationships, so the mothers took on father's roles and fathers took on mothers' roles, and the child was somehow skewed by gender and became schizophrenic when they get older. This is in the Eisenhower period in the 1950s. Uh, maybe we represent this by making a store on the back of a cornflakes packet in, in the 1950s. Okay, store of children. The mother, the father, the boy, the girl, the dog and the cat. Uh, daddy goes off to work every day. Mummy says to him and does the cooking, wearing high heel shoes and the pillow for, cooks delicious meals for the children. Daddy comes home from the office in the evening. Uh, and the uh, family we all live around the table. Saturday, Daddy gets out and washes the car, takes the bins out, and Mother maybe does some to no posture and so on. In other words, says she turned the, the daughter wants to go up to be a nurse, and the boy, of course, goes up to want to be a doctor. In other words, strictly gender bias relationships. There was the analysts of. Uh, What's the Hitchcock film about psychosis? Sorry? What's the Hitchcock film about psychosis? Um, um, Not psycho. No, no, no. Is it called Delirium or Nightmare? No. It's based on an actual institution called Chestnut Lodge, which is where well healed yes. middle class families would have their um, compulsion would have their schizophrenic children treated with sort of daily psychoanalysis across the group for open and so on. And Chesterton to Lodge gave rise to various stories of the origins of schizophrenia, normally blaming the parents. In the case of my back of the conflicts, type example, is skewed family relations. So mummy goes out on Saturday, takes the garbage out, Mummy cleans the car, daddy doesn't have a job, says that they're looking after the babies and then the cooking and so on. Uh, that was argued to be highly pathological at the time. Compulsion nightmare. Like hey, well, it's, it's a Hitchcock horror film set in this particular uh, psychological institution which gave rise to these theories. The birds? The one with the birds? Yeah. The birds. That one you're talking about? It's called, yes, Chestnut Lodge, which is the proper name of it, in the film I don't know what it's called. There's a skewed relationship in the film, right? The, the psychiatrist yeah, falls in the love of the patient. Them, but the, the birds, the one I'm, I'm thinking about, the birds, one with the, the, the look for these birds coming inside the house, is that one is referring? The, the, the birds, is that one you're referring? The birds, not the birds, no. 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 This is all in the mind. Suspicion? Well, suspicion? 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 Yeah. Suspicion? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of the, I think Within about 19, maybe about 1950. Yeah. Oh, well, that gives an example. I mean, the whole film was set in this psychiatric institution. So that was it's very tangential anyway. But it still gave rise to so this institution gave rise to different theories 
Excuse me, it's probably just the Western Knowles, caused by some bands of family interaction. Together with the, the, the evidence taken by the WHO, that schizophrenia didn't seem to be found in colonized societies. So anyway, the WHO then started a project which is called the International Pirate Study in Schizophrenia, which is still continuing now, 30 years later, which tried to identify what the pan is called schizophrenia in England and uh, Europe and also found everywhere in the world. The first part of the study was to look at the campaign in America, the former people in America diagnosed with schizophrenia in Europe. The WHO found that uh, the cases we used are the differently and many depression or bipolar was not used at all in America. This is before lithium came in a novice treatment. And basically, schizophrenia in America just meant psychosis, uh, and that was all. But in Britain, which followed much more German system of classification, differentiated different types of schizophrenia, differentiated itself out from psycho and psychosis, uh, uh, man in depression, and other uh, patterns of illness. Okay, so using the English classification, WHO set up a developing instrument with basically a very long questionnaire with follows the mental state examination. It's called the PSE, or present state examination. We used it in England and America, and it was used in America in all the rates of schizophrenia down to somewhere like the English rate, and the conclusion was to spend on our meaning of the word. Using this rather English based questionnaire, which is the one eventually used, and the rates in the beginning of the America were essentially the same. So, the first bit of the international study looked at nine countries around the world to see if they had anything called schizophrenia and whether it had the same sort of form. The countries examined were in the America, the first two countries in the study Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia. Denmark, Taiwan, Colombia, Nigeria, India, I think that's nine, the nine sides anyway. And two things were found out, using the very strict category of schizophrenia, one possibly the same as for Schneider's first rank symptoms, you know about Schneider? Okay. So you know, the first kind of symptoms of schizophrenia, they are found everywhere in the world. Uh, the conclusion of that said that Norway softened down to simplify to say that 1% of everybody around the world has schizophrenia. Not quite true. It's about 2% in Denmark and half a percent in India, for the countries on uh, the around 1%, not exactly 1%. And have the same first sign symptoms uh, uh, everywhere in the world. Okay. The conclusion will put schizophrenia out to be a fair biological disease, not associated with culture at all. But the WHO decided to do a follow up study which they got to the prognosis of schizophrenia in the uh, in those same countries. And here's a bit of a surprise, so we still can't explain now. We know that in England, the more effort you put into uh, dealing with somebody's schizophrenia, the better results you get. So if you give them regular medication, uh, regular checkup appointments, make sure they're physically healthy, they see a social worker or CPN every now and then, they attend the day centre, do something like heart therapy, on that sort of therapy and so on. We know the, 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 better, the better they'll do. Extrapolating from that, might imagine those countries which can afford those sort of initiatives, the patients in them will do better than those that don't. So each country like England, well, if you've got the medicine, got the social workers and all the rest of it, even if for these days we uh, we don't spend much on me me uh, mental health, so they spend more than you would do in a country like Cambodia or Congo and so on. 
So you assume that the general prognosis of schizophrenia will be better than rich in the country, just because you provide more facilities. Now, the problem here is that we don't find that, we find the opposite. And it still has not been explained. The poorer the country, the better a patient with schizophrenia does. Uh, the explanation is up for grabs. A uh, consistent explanation which works will probably win a Nobel Prize. This is such an important issue. My next explanation is that schizophrenia is probably a two-part illness. The Greek letter uh, sigma to the stand for schizophrenia. Well, I think the primary insult with schizophrenia is probably biological. We know it happens with uh, uh, brain damage, there's a biology association, there's genetic associations, more common among identical twins, uh, more common is a compli complication of organic diseases of brain and so on. So it's just that what is, uh, the first step is biological. But non-European societies have argued that it makes for a short-acting illness, so the acute psychosis, which is probably time limited and doesn't uh, have any severe deficits. But in Western societies, the biological problem is interpreted socially and it's the social interpretation that leads to the chronic illness of schizophrenia. So imagine this say my patient doesn't turn up to the clinic, they get worse, they get ill again, I eventually see them after a couple of months. I say, you idiot, why don't you take your tablets, why don't you come and see your social worker, why don't you try to manage everything by yourself? Uh, then you realize that you're ill, you have this illness called schizophrenia. And him knows what patients who have schizophrenia understand themselves by having schizophrenia. So I, I never to made the patient somewhat guilty, responsible for themselves, and maybe in the case of schizophrenia, that's actually bad for it. It might be just, just happens to be uh, the brain process, mind processes, which fall from schizophrenia. Okay? But in the third world society, the explanation will be less psychological, less physical, and probably more social. The experience will be something like saucy. I say, well, I'm sorry you got here again. It wasn't your fault. That neighbor of yours was doing the saucy against you and started it up again. So just take some medicine and you, you'll get better again. So in other words, the prognosis of schizophrenia in a country with witchcraft beliefs will be better than those with the, uh, biomedical beliefs. I am assume that psychiatrists incorrectly uh, that, uh, that we need to convince the patient of a biomedical explanation that somehow by some process of magic I will actually make for a better prognosis. The prognosis is better the poor of the country. It goes against obvious reasoning but we have to interpret it somehow. I mean, some psychiatrists said we got the epidemiology wrong that actually prognosis is worse in the poor country but not an accepted opinion is better the poor of the country. So similar studies are right at the count. Similar studies were done on depression. Depression is also more complicated. I don't think I have time to talk about that. It's probably less, in some ways less biological than the schizophrenia. In some ways it's more biological. The social points on the whole in Europe have been concerned about the loose use of pathological terms by the Americans. And the one uh, argue that some societies are paranoid or, or are dominated by witchcraft or whatever, they prefer more nuanced, everyday, descriptive and modest approach based on intensive field work. We live for a year, a year and a half with the local population and the local language and actually living with them. My example when I was working in Trinidad, I stayed with a, in a small fishing village with an old man and his wife. 
and because of the accommodation was limited, I shared the bed with the old man for over a year. Now I know what he dreams about. He'd wake up in the middle of the night talking in his dreams. He'd wake me up. I listen to him talking away. So in a sense I have a direct route into his unconscious. I don't know I know everything about that particular couple. I was with them the whole time. I went to the bathroom with them. I had food with them. I had conversations with them. So I actually know them very well. And that's generally what social anthropologists do. And just dishing out a question there and then getting away again is actually their poor substitutes. Eventually, something was similar with what they call ethnopsychiatry, ethnopsychiatry, which is even more likely to combine psychoanalysis but with detailed fieldwork, particularly associated with the French and Georges de Valois. Gender anger American the trend has become in cultural psychology and been ever closer to social anthropology. While well, something's called the new cross-cultural psychology, uh, I'll give you another paper, uh, which I like to find the new cross-cultural psychology. It in the 1980s, think about the crime in the US and myself in Britain. And they emphasize the rich detail and the suspicion of using Western questionnaires, rating skills, and diagnostic uh, uh, catches. Notice we move stay closest to the, the local view. So rather than take some Western category, devise a question on it and spin it out to some unfortunate local, we more likely to do the opposite. We devise a questionnaire maybe from uh, evening categories and apply it to the West. That's what my colleagues or so John has done, which he devised a questionnaire uh, about semen loss syndrome, uh, common belief in uh, India and uh, South Asian in general, the men are losing their semen and losing their energy and becoming ill. He devised a question in relation to that, and he then used that question in London and taxi drivers and other people. He found that semen loss syndrome is actually quite common among English uh, people. This is an example of reverse category fallacy. So if we're going to work one way or for Western categories in the small scale communities, we need to be able to do the opposite as well. Okay, final point on the DSM, uh, don't know the Cecil Manual, the main and make and compendium of uh, diagnostic categories. Until DSM-3, it's largely psychoanalytical and took a different form, became a lot more descriptive. And this M4, which I was on the committee for, we devised a list of culture bound syndromes, which we put in the appendix in this M4. This M5, which I didn't join, then we dropped that particular list, but emphasized other things like cultural competence and so on. Okay, well, there we are. Eh? in my analysis of the psychiatry, which I wrote as a junior doctor years ago, being revised, but it's a bit out of date now. It's called the Aliens and Alienists, oh, okay. originally a Penguin book, 1982, yeah. by Little Nugget Sitcher. The one I called Pathologies of the West, which is about cultural understanding of certain Western pathologies. So all the Western illness has culture bound syndromes. Uh, that came out uh, about 10 years ago. Published by Continuum Press. One of the makers published by Cornell University. In my PhD is called Pathology and Identity. I was written on this cult in the Caribbean. It's an anti-white, back to Africa cult, who um, led by somebody who was psychotic. So this is the first time we've done a detailed study of a cult led by somebody who's mad. We often say the leader of some group is mad, or Jim Jones was mad, or well, the founder of the um, 
people's temples, uh, people's temples Jones, isn't it? Or um, who's the guy at Waco? Either Waco, the Seventh Day Adventist cult, most besieged by the U.S. firearms administration, Ben Daniel, who was killed about 12 years ago. I've got his name. Maybe he says he was psychotic. But the trouble is, you've got no evidence. But in my case, I was able to stay with the cult, with the leader, and assess her mental health in great detail. So I was there for about a year. So I gave her the prison state examination, the questionnaire I mentioned uh, a moment ago. And the group are actually great fun anyway. Well, the new book coming out this June on cosmology and madness. Bergham Press, I don't know what it's called. Somewhere like God's Cosmos and Madman, something like that. Remember about Arthur Kleiman, the leader of uh, New Cross Cultural Psychiatry in America? It's called Patients and Healers in the Context of Culture. That was in about 1980, that's University of California Press. The main leader of the French school is Georges Devereux. His book's called Normal and Abnormal. That was published about 30 years ago. Who's been his culture and personality book? Well, I talked about saying, talking about paranoid societies and obsessional societies and so on. That's called Patterns of Culture. That was written in about 35. Published by, must be in the European Bar Source of you. And the best English book on the rationality of witchcraft, the one I mentioned by Evans Pritchard, is called Witchcraft, Oracles and Magic Among the Zandi, a tribe in uh, southern Sudan. Once we're now in the war with the Dinka in the war of a, a newly independent southern Sudan. So it's preached to found this society in which everybody is doing witchcraft on each other. So everybody is doing sorcery. But it's totally non-paranoid society. It's just easy, very easily done. You're not really worried about people doing sorcery on you. You just get the witch to confess, which says, I'm sorry, it's doing sorcery on you. And that's the end of the matter. So it's totally non-paranoid, but 100% are witchcraft accusations. That's the famous English ethnography, Evans Pritchard, Witchcraft Oracles and Magic. Okay, well, here's an example of what we're going to be talking about. This is, this is an example of an investment from a psycho uh, tropic drug investment from the Journal of Psychiatry. And so the, there are two things going on there. One is it's a simple investment for some pharmacological. It's the picture represents somebody as hyper anxious and treatment is biomedical and new phenazine sulfate. But at the same time, this is a conventional idea of uh, a nose or mentors. In other words, a house arrest. Mm. Which I suggest is something to do with a woman's place being in the home, okay? See this poor woman imprisoned in her house, unable to go away. But you give a new Naldo and she opens the gate and escapes to freedom. So what, so what medical anthropology is interested in is the relationship between these two ideas. Between the folk idea which we use in the end of the advertisement and also the, the biomedical idea. Next one please. Oh, here, we are, here, we here we have the same thing again. Mm -hmm. An anxious housewife, 
She's a housewife, still wearing a pinafore, trying to do the cleaning. Terrified of a mouse. And she sees the mouse is much larger than it is. When anxiety gets out of proportion, new Gexitan, whatever Gexitan is, I've forgotten. Um, we're amazing, I'm still used. Cuts it down to size. Okay, so again, the popular image of the of the woman terrified by a mouse, a mouse, quite a harmless animal, but the pharmacology will help her return to normal. Okay, next one. Uh, okay, we had a bit of this a moment ago. Taking all the things we can call mental illnesses or psychopathology. We can put them on the spectrum between those things, biology course and those which are social course. A certain medical um, uh, mental illnesses are of course biological. You have something getting wrong with your brain, you have anemia, uh, you have a cerebral tumour, you have alcoholism and degeneration of the uh, mammary bodies or whatever, or thiamine or vitamin deficiencies. So there are biological causes of mentors. Things which in general in psychiatry we call the functional psychoses or the organic disorders. But at the same time, for our illnesses, we don't understand purely social. So it's the other end of my spectrum. At the biological end, our logic, our sense, our epistemology is essentially the same as that of general medicine. We penetrate between the cultural incrustation and get down to the real biological disease that underlines it, okay? So, um, our patient who is alcoholic and maybe we've got a uh, coarse cough syndrome and maybe he has hallucinations of some sort. So, our job is to penetrate beneath the hallucinations, get to the biomedical reality, okay? But the problem is in the other end of our spectrum. There's no biomedical reality. Say the most common reason for women to be admitted to hospital for psychiatric reasons. What's that? What's the most common reason for women? Depression? Not quite, nearly there. Happens on Saturday and Sunday nights. Pardon? Happens on Saturday and Sunday nights. It's an act. Cleaning? What? Well, Cysteine. OCD? I can't remember. And there were other okay. doses of drugs, okay? Oh, oh, oh drugs and drugs. That's the second most common reason for men to admit it. It's not so sort of gender based. Now, if we tend to penetrate beneath the overdose, or for the biomedical reality, we get nowhere. There's no biomedical reality to take in an overdose. It's a totally different sort of pattern of action. It's a pattern of action and it's intentional. You take an overdose in order to do something. So we go along and see the woman who's taken uh, 50 uh, valium tablets and she says, you know, I was very really sick of my husband I want to show him I won't put up with him anymore. I'm tired of him being violent. I just wanted to show him enough is enough. So excuse me, she's doing it in order to do something. There's no in order to do at the biological end. These men deficiencies are not trying to do anything. They're not sentient beings, so the whole scheme is under prime. But he's on the right hand side, not different sort of the logic which in uh, social sciences normally use the two German terms uh, initiated in the 19th century between the Verstehen and Ekwaren. I guess we need a bit of German here. <laughs> Western understanding uh, 
I can't explain it, okay? And they'll say to be used by uh, Max Weber in his sociology in the early 19th century, the early 20th century. So if they say and understand it, I can't explain it. These are two totally different sources of logic. A crown assumes a cause and effect universe independent of human meaning. Things just happen to cause one another. The same sort of error as natural sciences. So we go a crown and naturalistic approach. But then on the other hand involves understanding that the agents we're talking about are human beings. So the full human understanding. Involving such ideas as memory, deceit, intention, motivation, and so on. Things that make sense for human beings. So that's we sometimes call that the personalistic. So you have an opposition between the personalistic, which explains things at a social or psychological level, and uh, explanation, a crown, which operates things, and the natural science end of things. The problem with psychiatry is we have to operate both these two at the same time. And that is logically impossible. You can't think personally and naturally at the same time. You can't think something is caused by something else and also maintain the idea of human free will at the same time. If you think one, then you can think the other. But you need to alternate between the two. You can't think both exactly at the same time. And of course psychiatrists get in trouble with our patients. I have argued for a more biological approach and the patient wants some more humanistic or understanding sort of approach. So patients get very upset and say, oh, I know what's wrong with you. You've got depressive illness and then you open your drawer, have just the thing for you and you give out some lead tablets and so on and these will help you, uh, you see these will clear it up. The patient then might feel that the doctor doesn't understand what's actually going on with them. The compromise is equally true. If you see something that's intangible and it's biological, you'll probably kill the patient. Let's say we've got somebody with a malarial parasites in the brain, and we start um, by saying, it must be very unpleasant for you, what do you understand about them, what does it mean to you? And we don't do any blood tests and we don't treat them, they're going to die. So again, the one way we're inhuman, again, the other way we're incompetent. So we have to juggle the two together at the same time, and that's the fun of psychiatry, as you can argue about one or the other. Next one, please. <coughs> I mean, it's about people like Crapin and Sand did in Java, which I just talked about a moment ago. So on the left hand side we've got some local pattern of illness. I picked the one with a mock hair. And Crapin then translates this into Western categories, which he knows more about. And he decides a certain amount of people with a mock actually have schizophrenia, a certain amount have epilepsy. And also the, the two overlapping areas, some people would have uh, both together. So you translate the local category into the Western category, which on the whole these days we find is illegitimate, so we can't easily do that. No local category will ever be the same as any scientific category. In the same way, we can't actually translate any language into an R. No word in the language A is exactly the same as language B. It doesn't have the same conversations, doesn't have the same sort of meaning. So if you do have to translate it, we should probably put it in inverted commas and actually say there's an approximation to it. So don't go off to New Guinea and say schizophrenia in New Guinea is. I would say what well, seems to be something like a pattern of schizophrenia which is found in New Guinea is. And that's the legitimate. Okay, thanks. Here's my representation of the content form model. So on the left again we have our unknown illness. And tradition by medicine we separate out the illness into the form, which is the universal biology, something like a cup, 
uh, which determines the diagnosis and the treatment. And then it's for the content, which is either given by the local culture or by individual variation, personality and so on. And we even normally make this distinction. And your consultants presumably ask you this in the course of board rounds and so on. What I'm trying to make is, it's not easy to say which is form and which is content. We assume form is given by universal, by biology. Will you try to demonstrate to me that skin feelings caused by biology, you won't have much luck. You can't make out a case of skin feeling being biology. You waffle about dopamine or corpus callosum or the, the increased uh, size of ventricles or whatever, but you can't demonstrate the, the, what the person experienced is biology of course. And related to that is we can't explain to the patient what the illness actually is. But doctor, doctor, you can tell me I've got schizophrenia and you say take these tablets, okay, well, what is schizophrenia? Doctor, please tell me. And we can't. Nobody can. Uh, okay, we normally associate these with the pathogenic. Pathogenic is the form actually gives rise to the pathology. Pathoplastic is the variable, the content. So this one. So pathogenic is form, pathoplastic content. We do stop me from not happy. If you have any question, anything isn't clear, make sure that you ask him. I just grab it on until you stop me. Yeah. So here we'll send you the game. Now Crapin spells wrong, it is an E after the P of course. Uh, so yes, it's the uh, pathogenic symptoms that are universal. So there's a symptom say of um, first hand symptoms of schizophrenia are uh, part of the form and they're found wherever you find schizophrenia in the world. They are universal symptoms. So every schizophrenic has some, okay? Every two schizophrenic. Well, of course, we people who may diagnose as being schizophrenic who probably don't have them. Now, Breuer, who gave the name to uh, schizophrenia from the Craven's Dementia Precox, says so the characteristic symptoms that are part of the form. In other words, those which characterise schizophrenia as opposed to bipolar illness. So here in the uh, two voices talking together in the third person about you will be a universal symptom in Craven's terms, a broad terms will be a characteristic symptom in that will distinguish it from mania. Okay? Well, let us get into arguments today as well you get first round symptoms in non schizophrenia. I'm fairly sure you get them in bipolar ones as well, but just for the time being, we'll skip that. Okay. The, the ho this is a bit complicated. The horizontal line is what I just gave you before with the biological on the left hand side and the the social on the right hand side. See what the graphs is best explained in biological terms and social terms all on the on the right. The horizontal line is just for Western societies. Now, I haven't got time to argue the, the thing, I will argue this in my in my course. We're not taking that. For the time being you just have to take them where I put them. But schizophrenia way out on the biological side not totally on the biological side. Remember I said that fully developed schizophrenia is probably due to social response. But depression is variable, depends what we mean by depression. I put that rather vaguely in the middle. As we move over to agoraphobia and other extra versa, getting more and more into a social domain. Doing get eating disorders in the Caribbean for instance. And then you just now starting to appear in South Asia. Epidemic meeting us all in the war two years ago. That's the first time anybody had described it there. So this is a westernization of, of uh, 
uh, expands in developing countries. And your favorite game seems Western Pam. Is it moved towards the right? Every day is shoplifting, school refusing young boys, get more and more into socially embedded patterns. You can't get shoplifting where you don't have shops, obviously. You can't have it every day so you don't have pharmaceutical tablets. You can't get school refusal if you don't have a school. So these are patterns that only occur in, uh, in society. And further out towards the right, I put delinquency, because the pattern has been pathologized by doctors at times, particularly in America. I go on the whole thing and we feel delinquency is not a mental illness. But you can have psychosis, you argue that it is. Okay. So my no, 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 sorry, not that. So my Western pattern is the horizontal line. The what happens in other societies? In the area of I did the sloping line, which stands for a hypothetical non-Western society cortex, some tribal society in New Guinea or Amazonia. And here the universality of the pattern depends on the size, on the length between the two lines. On the left hand side, the human biology is very universal, more or less the same in other countries. Bar jaw patterns are nearly exactly the same. Cause the pattern uh, of slow virus infection uh, found in New Guinea was an endemic cannibalism. So it's slow virus, so it's very similar, very similar to HIV. And move over along the line, something similar to schizophrenia is worry, which means chronic psychosis in, uh, in Nigerian Yoruba language or brain madness, which is equivalent in Jamaica. Moving further over to the right, tobacco is a particular sort of tobacco, tobacco is a particular form of depression. You only get in seeing that, I haven't got time to talk about it, in which a man loses his wife and gets characteristic sort of depression. As we move further over to the right, we get in the air of culture-bound syndromes, okay? One man is all, our type of spirit possession found in New, uh, in New Guinea and in East Africa. A man says spirit possession in Morocco and so on. There are two points. The more we move over to the right on that thing, the more we move into the area of something called rituals. Are these things very illnesses or are they, are they social rituals which have some sort of resemblance to to an illness? In other words, uh, a particular predicament. That's one thing. Another thing, of course, is that coach balance syndromes are a term that should be applied to the West as well. I got in a lot of trouble when I was first person who said that. So I go down there eating the soldiers, having a favorite and so on, are our coach balance syndromes or my coach balance syndromes. A picture of Coro is a pattern in New Guinea, slow virus pattern, easily thought to be hysterical because the women got him more often than the men. Um, the only anthropologist who got a Nobel Prize, Gadget's sake, discovered in the 1950s is caused by a slow virus. We uh, are part of endemic cannibalism. Problem was that the virus only exists in central nervous system tissue. It was only women and children would eat those parts of people. The men would go for an arm or something a bit more chunky for a better, a better feed. The women and children just sent the brains. The women and children then got the virus. The so women particularly got, got the illness. These two are both self-informed with a woman in particular. So it's easy for to be related to gender relations, uh, the way men treat women and so on. But we now know it's biological. So it's moved from the far right hand side of my spectrum to the far left. And then this, this. Here's something that went the opposite way, this is Arctic hysteria or Pibrotilk. 
once thought to be biological because of uh, vitamin C deficiency on the diet and for the Inuit of just eating seals and, and whales. But we now think it's related to gender. In fact, the, the woman who's suffering from it is this woman lying on her back at the top and in the bottom there. Right. So we now see it in dissociative terms, similar to the way men treat women. Interestingly enough, it was found when for the Europeans got to the Inuit for Commodore Perry in the 1870s. It was found among dogs. This pattern was generally found among dogs, not among human beings. So the Inuit would describe the dog in you know, some sort of pattern like the woods, more nice. But since the Europeans get there, then the Inuit start describing it discovered among themselves, particularly among women. Which makes for an interesting structural point of view. The relationship between a human being and dog is the same as you are white to Inuit, uh, in terms of power and dominance and so on. What the dogs experience, having the faint side there, that's just what the locals say. So he's still called dog out there. Uh, uh. This. <gasps> This is just so, this is again back to Kuru. This is a tribes, the cannibalism passed on from one tribe to another. This is the date at which people started uh, getting the illness. Obviously, it doesn't just depend on cannibalism. All these types are cannibalistic, but the virus is only passed on in periods of time. So, starting in the 30s, Pass on from one community to another. It's only been education by the Australian colonial government in New Guinea in the 1950s. The pattern is finally wiped out. That's cool. Thought to be single, but we now know it's the slow virus. And the same pattern again. Picture from Italy, from Calabria. Uh, and two, we've got two sides here from the same village. Now, the story behind this slide is the young girl here on the left, who was slightly spaced out expression, who was a bit spacey, I'm quite spacey, uh, had been accused by the local villagers of being too intimate with a young man in the village. It's a rumor they had sex together. Disgusting for a good Catholic village. Now, Mala has solved this problem. Mala on the right. See, Mala's looking at a slightly crafty expression, slightly evil expression. I think it's evil. Yeah. By saying the young man was a witch, and he tried to ensorce or do sorcery on the daughter, Mala caught him out. He had to run away from the village and go to join to work in uh, the car factory, so or something like that. So he's left the village, he's out of the, the question. And now the man in this um, window, uh, in the house in the centre of the village, is the village is down there, and they're looking at the mother and the daughter, and man's explaining what actually happened. So the young girl is no longer guilty, she's not promiscuous, is a victim of sorcery, but luckily the young man has left the village and can't come back now. So it's designed to widen the reputation of the daughter, to make sure that she can get married to somebody else in her town. She's a man is doing a strategy to solve the daughter, solve the daughter's problem. Okay, the local explanation is sorcery, okay? Our explanation will be something like um, dissociative, um, she shapes a specific pattern or something like that. Okay. Inside. In the same village, we have this guy who's been in bed for the last 20 years. A local explanation is sorcery, okay? The same explanation as in the first case. He's a victim of sorcery. The explanation, our biomedical explanation, is more likely to be something like depressive stupor 
or catatonic schizophrenia. This is guys incontinent, he is in his pyjamas, he is there in bed and the family have to help him be an and feed him and so on. So in these two cases, the local explanation is the same. Source in the case of the woman, source in the case of the man, but our explanation is different. In the first case, a situation or survival strategy by the mother. In the second case, schizophrenia or severe depression. Next, please. The picture of a mock from the Philippines newspaper, just to show you Pandolin is given a mass homicide. This is the second night of three photographs of the near daily news I came across. The mock is the person on the left, okay? You can't quite see it. You see the little savage woman on his face. And he's on his hand holding a knife in his hand. He's chasing this man on the right. There's an off duty Philippines policeman on the beach. Philippines being a very tough society, he's wisely still carrying his pistol, even though he's sunbathing. The first picture that says is that Mock kills the companion of a policeman on the right, while a horrible picture hangs half his head off, and starts chasing the second policeman, who now, now pulls out his gun and fires at the Mock. He misses the Mock. And the third picture, the now and present one, the mock kills the policeman with his knife. And uh, subsequent pictures, which I don't have, are that the mock is then killed by another policeman who's uh, standing by also with a gun. It's just a picture of a mock. Don't often see pictures of it. In this given a mass homicide, Craven Z or schizophrenia or epilepsy. We see this as a situational pattern. It was a form of social revenge, and now it's probably just a, a, a social way of acting now as well. Thanks. Here we find the same thing among Australian Aboriginals, or other members of the um, Gulf of Carpentaria, it's the Gulf between Australia and New Guinea. Men and they quarrel, threaten each other. They friends, friends and shove a spare in each other. But on the home, they normally stop before you do any damage. Because on the spares often give you gangrene and so on. So the, the fight is not a, it's a, a threat to find a mock fight. And sometimes called wild man behaviour, and often found among young men who promise a bride for a family and then they refuse it. It's very common in New Guinea. It's about, again, a pattern of behaviour we generally don't see in the West. Or I could say friend insult in the bar would, would be something like that. Next. There is a famous uh, picture, the famous Tsar possession ceremony in the Samaria. It's the Tsar women who have been through possession themselves and the beating of the drums in a healing ritual. Next one, please. The Somali before the Eastern Civil War was a nomadic society. So wealthy people would accumulate numbers of donkeys, camels, goats, and so on. How did you accumulate them? By being a dependable person, by being a man who kept his wife in order. So if she didn't gospelize anybody, was went outside the veil on their head, with no hint of impropriety about it at all. So she's a decent woman. So that man you would trust, he knew how to look after and treat and keep his wife. She did business with him, and required a large amount of goats and camels and so on. Certainly so, but there were too many for the man to easily deal with. So Bob, this should be in any society. A man does the rest of you well. What do you do with all your wealth? Mm. When your consultant, the large private practice, and now you see it, see his children through a public school, at the age of about six, he's got so much money, what's he do with it? He can't smoke cigars and write them in a, a £10 note, because that's a vulgar thing to do. So he needs to wear 
converting them into something more portable. Since the West will probably get the more expensive car, the Lowe's Royce is a bit too vulgar, maybe eventually then. Or you might buy a boat and keep that away from your, from your business world. So you need a way of converting all this wealth into something more portable, but still prestigious. So the smiley man is not exactly the same problem. It's been a polygynous society. What he can do is to convert all these camels and goats with a second, younger and more attractive wife, which he proceeds to do. It's in that situation that the first wife can be possessed by the Tsar spirits. Her female spirits are jealous of men's power and make the woman who originally was decent and well behaved into something totally different. Can't trust her at all. She goes around without her, and the end goes on without her vow. She blasphemes, says horrible things about people, as if she's possessed by an evil spirit. And that's the local belief, she's possessed by a spirit. So the poor husband has to cheat his first wife. She so calls the ceremony, he gets, I need an orchestra to do the music for the ceremony, you need the healers, you need to get the women who've been through it before there's all drum uh, people, you need the audience from your kin, the nomadic society, you've got to wander around Somalia, trying to find out where your family would go to. Eventually you assemble the whole thing and do the healing ritual, which the woman becomes possessed properly by the Tsar spirits. But in the very functional point of view, this whole sermon has probably cost the husband so much he can't afford to engaged in the second marriage. That's all in the very mechanistic terms as has been interpreted by the major English anthropologists who worked on Samara, Young Years from ASC. Thank you. Since an adapt possess spirit possession is adaptive, the person who becomes possessed. Next one. Thanks. Oh, I haven't got time for that, sorry next one. Too much. Okay, the term contraband syndrome is traditionally used. I've been used to refer to local bands of time and behavior, specific to particular culture, and recognized as discreet and abnormal by informers and observers alike. It's not necessarily as an illness, but as abnormal or something that shouldn't be going on in the game. Few instances which have a biological cause, that's probably because of the way they were studied. Third, an important point, interviews not held to be aware or responsible in the everyday sense. So this evil space descend on me, it's not my fault, space just descend and makes me do certain things. It's not me doing it, it's the spirit doing it. It's not the same as the disease actually acts against your volition. When we talk of Parsons, the American sociologist, is born the social system in 1950, first describes the illness behaviour. It says the illness behaviour when you are ill has two major characteristics. One is you're not responsible for it. There's a disease happening to you. So the same as the evil spirit, the disease just drops on you and there's nothing you can do about it. Second characteristic in Parsons says it, it, it involves other people in, in concern. The, you, the people are worried about you. It involves you. That's probably related to my fourth type of behavior, which has a dramatic quality. Yes, no, my, it's my, it's my, it must be me. Huh? It's my model. There are three stages in the culture balance in them. First of all, some is dislocated out of the normal situation. Young man, New Guinea's, uh, refused the wife he was promised. Uh, the Somali woman uh, has uh, a rival, her husband gets married to somebody else. But he has dislocated the individual. That's the social situation. Now, this is the case of this exaggeration. So, the second stage is exaggeration of the dislocation. We can suggest that they have conventional version of normal behavior. 
So smart woman is in a sense symbolically saying, Oh, you didn't want me as your, as your beloved wife, you know, you want another woman now. In that case, you're not treating me as a human being or treating me as some wild monster from the bush, and so I behave in that appropriate way. Was then falls on a restitution uh, by the husband from the person back into everyday relations. This has gone too far. His first wife is saying and behaving as if she's not a human being anymore. Society can't cope with that and brings her back into society. Next one. Okay, here I'm going to send it. Um, probably quite a little bit of thinking about. Most human communities would distinguish in the natural and the cultural. The things which are specific to human beings and things which are part of nature out there. Do you want to have a pen? Do you want a pen? Oh, no, thanks. Oh. So we have this society makes this thing between the social human world of culture and the asocial natural world of uh, outside there. What happens at the end of the village, a bush or whatever. But the same distinction, culture and nature, is also used within society to distinguish men and women. The culture nature difference then operates at two levels, both between humans and non-humans, but within human society, it is seen as men from women. And men are dominated in all societies, to the claim that they are more cultural and women are more natural. Women are controlled by their emotions, always having periods, have babies and so on. So they're close to nature, in men's ideology. Okay, so then the woman gets excluded and pushes out out of human society into the realm of nature. But we call the culture bank cinema it's just an exaggeration of that exclusion. So instead the woman seems to disappear into the natural world altogether. Forces the husband and society to restitution to bring them back. Maybe spend so much money on the healing so you can't afford to get married anyway. Okay. So I'd argue for three stage model of culture and syndromes or exclusion, exaggeration and restitution. I've brought so much for male pants as well. Not all culture and syndromes women are more commonly found with whereas the culture and syndromes are predominantly a boom woman's problem. It's that the same as men to illnesses are more common in women than men in Western society. Hey, this please. Uh, this is a different way we represent the skin that. So that's called a stress of diagraph. It's just a fancy way of demonstrating the same thing. Same as the previous style. Next please. Okay, now I'm picking a male pattern. This is from Morocco, the Moroccan pilgrimage fair, where people come to respect the saint, the Islamic saint, the pitch in their tents, set up stores, and so on. Next one, please. In the course of this, we might see some like this going on. The man here in the middle is bending towards us, wearing the dark gown. I see a lot of things going on, people playing drums, music, uh, drums are very drums there. Uh, some people are not concerned at all. There's a girl down behind the man in the room with him at all. Look at some excuse me, something else going on. So there's everything is a, a circus like fair like uh, atmosphere. Who are closer to the man, next slide please. The same picture again, more close up, 
You can't quite see what he's doing. He's with a knife, he's cutting down his scalp to the scar. There's a sort of healing just you can't you can't quite see it. Look, he's got short hair, he's knees up. What has happened is this man was possessed by a female jinn, an Islamic uh, spirit, maybe God of Evil, but generally plague of men and women. This man who should be having the boy children, always showing the daughters, he's lost his job, he's become ill, his father's died, he's a failure as a man. She's obviously been possessed by a female jinn, which is the earth of men's power. Very jinn like Aisha, this is one of the most common jinn, which shares the same name as the, the Prophet's daughter. So he goes on to join this fraternity, he wears his special gown, and with other members who have been through it. With his knife, he cuts down, down to his skull, through the skin and must the top of his head. And says to the spirit, you want me to be a woman? No, I'm a woman, okay. He uses the obscene word for vagina. He says, I basically says, I've got a cunt, you see. You want me to be a woman, I've got a cunt. And, and he opens it and shows up, okay. Shows the spirit. At which point he joins the fraternity. He dedicates himself to the spirit. Who then does sort of deal with him if he reveres her, she will not persecute him anymore and she will actually bring him luck and so on. The important thing is, spirit possession in poorer countries is the norm of this thought, you do a deal, you accommodate with the spirit. Western example you've probably seen in the horror films, you just turn away source them, you cast out the spirit altogether, so you've seen all those type of horror films. It's not a pattern in the third world, you do a deal with the spirit. You never totally get rid of her. So there's no absolute good and evil, it's just a sense of accommodation. That's what happens in this situation. So every year he's got to go with the other members of the fraternity, he's got to pay homage to Aisha or whatever spirit he involves, and dedicate uh, himself to her. This one. And so what happens in the West, in uh, the Italian picture, depending on this view from my non-Western Westerners. So the festival of St. Andy of Padua, a woman member of the congregation, had become possessed by some uh, floating uh, spirit in the crowd outside the church. Next one. Mm -hmm. You take this photo? Oh. You take this photo. Oh. So, no, no, no. no, no. Interested. Oh. Well, then will you tell me what this is? I shouldn't know. It's in Italy. It's yeah. in Italy. Sunday three. Huh? Sunday three. Yeah, but I don't know. I've never seen it before. What's the possession? In this way, I've never seen it. It's just dancing. A tarantella. Ah, in the church. Yeah. I'm going to talk about this later. <laughs> I'm going to talk to them in the afternoon about it. There's a special sort of tarantula spider in Sunday three. A magic spider which bites you and then possesses you. And uh, there's a called the Tarantula. It gives rise to a healing dance, or the, also uh, the dance you dance when you're bitten, called the Tarantella. Briefly in the 1920s, became a fashionable dance in the West. Its origins are pathological. So basically you dance the evil spirit out. And this lady just climbed up the you also want these rather baroque chests you find in Italy and elsewhere. So they also stand there and she's climbed up here, wow. presumably supplicating Jesus or something. So can you still can you do get spray possession in the West? Mm -hmm. We're getting into it anyway. Yeah, you get everything you need. I'll talk more later about this. Now this is what happened in England. This is England side of the spray possession. <laughs> In the 17th century woodcut of Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general, yeah. interviewing two witches. They are on their chairs. Hopkins in the back, he's tortured the two ladies 
and then I'll confess it. Well, the left says, well, my familiar, um, the animal which possesses me is called Holt. And the other one says, mine's names are Ili Mauser and Pie Wacket. And that's where it's down there. Sack and Sugar, Jayamala, News, and Nigga Tom, Peck in the Crown, and Grizzle Greedy Guy. The names of the evil spirits possessing them. Now, uh, inside their spirit possession, uh, I probably think of so it's a historical phenomenon. If you go on to Pentecostal church, you find plenty of, of current spirit possession. And people become possessed in the course of the service. Which I frequently observed. Okay, next one. Well, something stark is the passage from evil spirits into, into less personalised naturalistic uh, forms of energy. This is uh, Otto Mesmer, who gives the to mesmerism. He's in the 1780s. The Baquette, which is a sort of zinc bath for the dilute sulfuric acid. If you stick your fingers in it, you get a mild electric shock. It's just a present sort of tingle here. It doesn't hurt you. And Mesmer used this treatment for synosia and meant to pass with as a form of treatment of neurosis. French College of Physicians in the investigation decided that Mesmer was a quack who was scared out of France, but his principles continued. So mag magnetism was a physical force which could be felt in the human body, but felt subjectively, was by similar on the outside and touching the arm or a leg, you feel the magnetism within it. And we see something which filled the universe, was present in planets and trees, in the earth and the human beings, and caused what we would call neurosis or, or disturbance. No also found there uh, by the Marquis de Puiseguer, the French nobleman, who in the same period sees his presence uh, with the electricity. So I think we've got the grand in the hair. Uh, it was peasants who got neurotic symptoms or lack of energy or they not working hard enough. What does it connect them? These chains coming down from the tree, the powerfully magnetic tree, can't remember what sort it is. They're not chained up, they're holding on to the chain. Oh, this is quite voluntary, it's not hurting them. But they feel powerful animal magnetism coming down the chains and heal. It's easy if he in his, his own presence. And for the next hundred years, magnetism was practiced largely by country doctors in particular in France, who maintained some sort of therapeutic existence. This one. But next appears in neurology, okay? The big jump from Mesma and Prisiga to Jean Martin Charco. For his teaching in Solpetri in Paris in the 1890s. This is Charco here. We've got the close ups. I see your photographer. Yeah. Um, yeah. The shark is this guy here without the bed, and he's demonstrating a lady with his stare. Now just notice a few things. All the audience are male, every single one. <laughs> the patient, uh, who's called uh, Bronch Wittmann, is female. And the only other female is this older, less attractive nurse, who's deliberately now on the right. Whilst women herself is younger, because they will give decolletage, the dress is going to be now. It's definitely a sexual element now. A woman eventually ran away with one of Sharko's medical students oh. and married him. She's an ex prostitute. Oh, yeah. Okay, two other points. The, the man standing behind uh, the patient is uh, Babinski of the Babinski reflex, which he elaborated with the Solpetri Clinic. And the man with the apron here in the foreground is. Um, 
Judah Torret, who is named Torret to them, the both pupils of Shalko. Freud is not here in this picture, but we know he joined this uh, group uh, in the, about 1893 on a scholarship from the Austrian government. Now, I think Shalko fancied himself as an artist, did large paintings of the stages of his stare. Here you see on the top left, stage four, are him, uh, his stare, Zopis Fartanos, when you bounce on your leg and the, and the backs of your heels, and was extremely state of dissociated his stare. Okay, well, what I argue, the same thing is going on here as in the Arab pictures of witchcraft. Male domination, performing woman woman being healed, but the genuine woman's achieving some minor uh, one negotiation going on, but essentially in a male dominated world. And I argue that because uh, Freud spent time with Sharka, same thing happens in psychoanalysis. This is a rather fanciful picture from John Houston's film Freud of, uh, I forgot the name of the actor now, where it's suddenly playing Freud in the armchair uh, with the, the female patient who's maintaining the same social role. The patient is, of course, Anna O, the first psychological patient. It's very doubtful she even met Freud or taught him. Uh, she was actually a pupil of his and for his colleague, uh, Manfred and the Breuer. Breuer, Joseph Breuer, mm -hmm. who Floyd started working on this theory with. But for the point of John Houston's film, uh, it was a lot more active few mark. But I'd maintain this is the same relationship we got before. It could be understood in terms of power and gender. And just the one's got more unconscious, the time's gone. Next one. Mm. And something similar happened in Chinese medicine. In the late 18th century, Chinese uh, mm. calligraphy was um, uh, reformed. We have here two words for medicine in general. The so one on the top. A little picture of the shaman doing his dance with a, a whisk or bird drum or whatever. And underneath him, a true and transfigured stance and they came from becoming spirit possessed. In the 1890s, Chinese fellows a bit old fashioned. Kept the figure of the shaman, who now becomes the doctor. But then transfigured dancing a place by a bottle. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's so interesting. So everything becomes more internalised, less social. So it's not a purely Western thing. Next, please. The way the human brain and mind was divided up in the late medieval period, with the section of the horizontal layers. Each week could be picked from the either the rare say rares of the cerebral cortex, each one with an astrological sign determining it. Mm. But the error form was that inside the, the rares there were fully formed human beings. There were sort of uh what's the other one? Micro small people, micro Small people. Small people, micro. With a small brain, you mean? No, just small people. Midget, I don't know. Midget. Uh, no, 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 some which evil spirits and so on. So the spirit possession then is relatively straightforward in the unicycled part of the brain uh, which is a figure from outside. 
microcosm. Tell me it's an astrology. In astrology, micro cosmic would be the one in astrology. It's another you know what it's like. Can't think of it. Problems are having to dement in the lecture, I'm afraid. And she gets something young in this, yeah. Uh, anyway, so so they've separate the figures uh, in the medieval form. Next slide please. And crazy things get more and more dimensional. The picture of a cartoon by an English artist Hogarth, which I think is the first linear display of emotion. So what's, what Hogarth is doing is satirising religious mania. So these people are supposed to be in church and praying, where this priest has got his um, hand in the bosom of one's more attractive people and they're, they're not in the picture of Jesus falling to the floor. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of naughty things are going on when people are supposed to be playing. But the point is, there's a scale here on the right hand side, which will spin like a thermometer. Sure. Can I have some of his brain at the bottom? Madness and prophecy at the bottom. And the top priest. Joyful and pleased. And pleased and joyful. Right. So in other words, we have a bipolar pattern there. Mm -hmm. It's the first representation of bipolar illness. In other words, things get naturalized. Before that, we had heat, and now we have temperature, which is more objective. The temperature you can tell is 4 degrees, not 2 degrees, where it's just heat, you say. I would say it's hotter, feels hotter than this. But he's getting more and more in that the dimension. And same thing happens with psychology in these spirits, which once more to constitute human being, now become part of the human mind. To so become a natural spirit, to use the very term used in the 18th century. Natural spirits are like magnetism or frogs. Do you remember when you did um, History of physics at school, we had frogs in the face of combustion. So the property of the element that makes something burst into flames is constitutional and physical and natural and doesn't have consciousness. Okay, this one. Okay, so this is the error idea. It's, a, it's not an actual representation, it's just schematic. So the idea is if you, if you see somebody's head in the chemical furnace and all sorts of fantasies come out already fully formed. Mm. That's quite different from the dimensional view, which is more or less the same as you get in a psychology textbook now. You just go back a bit. Mm. Back. That one. Say that one. This is more the same as the psychology of textbook. You meant this is uh, social psychology, physiological psychology, cognitive psychology, emotional psychology, and so on over, and physiology down there, perception down there. Uh, textbook, so I don't know what psychology book you use now. It's one called the Hogarth Nankinson, which is arranged just like these particular words. So each layer represents a different faculty, not a different personage. We moved away from personages to natural processes. How many said? Sorry? Was a monkey that's the word that you did? I was, yeah. A monkey, it's not micro. Okay, no, no. So the idea was the human mind's capacity of the monkey. Thanks. We go on a couple. This one. Uh, these patterns only work if there's an actual threat. Uh, this is the lesson I find rather distasteful. It's telling me to use an antidepressant, which my patients can safely take as an overdose. 
But don't take tricyclics because you're taking an overdose. But you can safely take um, Meandrum, so you just now, of course. It's a lot of mawkish picture of a grieving husband and the tearful children watching their suicide or ma suicide in mother and taking the corpse out of the door. And I was used to sell the door, of course. It's out of BJP. Mm. This is the next one. So again, how much would you give to save her life? I mean, you need to prescribe medicine A, not medicine B, and so on. You really pee into us emotionally just to sell something. Okay, and the nauseous in my model applies to everything. Here's a picture of a man who's depressed. I'm not just in the coach bounce in the model applies to all Western illnesses. Uh, that's what he does for this. This is no, all those no drama here. But there may be, uh, we come to depress men in the moment, that's all. So we're getting away from this sort of model, okay? This doesn't tell us anything. We're just in social roles. This is an interesting one. Here's the same anti-anxiety drug is used to advertise both to men and women. You notice the other, uh, the patients in the other dresses were women. And here, new ensembles and the guitars are up um, helping you to get over her uh, depression. It was this pathetic woman. She got the children out of control, children dropping milk bottles, Remember milk bottles? You used to have milk in bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not just spinning them. There are some sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so, so the children drop the milk on the floor. The sense of loss is she can't cope anymore. <laughs> so she needs new, new. But the uh, solution is here. New whatever it is. Hang on. Anzone. Ketazora. Ketazora. And still used? I don't know. Okay, we'll send this next picture, please. This uh, medicine is also used for men. So the man has real problems. A woman just gets hysterical, can't cope with the kilts, drops the milk and so on. This poor man has a real How will he support his family? This is an example of the gender difference in near all anti anxiety drugs are marketed uh, uh, for women. Third picture of this one. Here's the third picture advertising the same drug. This is very obvious what's going on here. With the doctor, with the patient. Patient's obviously is some rather anxious man in the background. Daughter's a woman in the foreground. You see she's a daughter. This has got a white coat and so on. But of course it's not. The man is the doctor and the woman is the patient. The doctor indeed writing a prescription for her. So the day gender reasserts itself. So I did some years ago on gender in the psychopharmacological advertisements. And he found two advertisements in which the, the daughter was a woman. And one is the person was actually for medical insurance, and the other one was uh, backed by another male daughter. So there was a female patient, uh, sorry, male patient, female junior daughter, and then a male senior daughter. So I didn't really subvert anything. So this is very gender, male to female represents start to patient. Next one, please. And here we have this extraordinary one. Mm -hmm. Drug for anxiety as a suppository. If you're a woman and you're anxious, you just stick one of these up your vagina. And bizarre, isn't it? New presentation suppositories. 
we have a lovely feminine that flows for our much more than just a tranquilizer. <laughs> okay. really? What more were you? And the, the gender, the, I, I won't comment on this. Vaginal flush. Here we have the medicine a butterfly. Benzana, sorry. Now you no, yeah, it's okay. So men, men, both for him. He only wants the coat of arms to college and psychiatrists, which all wear all our uh, cufflinks or ties or there. And gender is hair, of course. The snakes are the the serpents of each Scorpius, the Caduceus, uh, the male, the hero. And the butterflies are the butterflies of psyche, the female and the patient. What so the patient and daughter, male or female. So where is this going for? Your coat of arms. Oh. Have you got MRC psych? Sorry? Have you got your MRC psych? You are a psychiatrist? Yeah, 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 I'll work for that. When you get it, you you quite you might get special brooch. Oh, really? You get cuff rings. Well, man, you wear a tie with this on. This is our coat of arms, called a psychiatrist, which represents this male, female, uh, opposition. Serpents of the male, serpents of Aesculapius, the Greek healer, called the Caduceus. The butterflies represent the Greek, uh, called the psyche, the uh, female, the patient. The male daughter, female patient, is written into this. So there's no escape. Nice. Oh, you can just skip through these very quickly. Okay. Whereas these are a picture of Sosa, a picture of anxiety in Latin America. Similar sort of argument I've used before. Nice, nice. 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 Okay, thanks. No, you know. Uh, the, the picture of us are anxiety said in South America called Sosa. Now these things involve full total drama. In the picture of uh, an overdose involves a fire brigade, the police, the ambulance, the everybody who's actually involved. It's one. This is an example of the island of Tikapair in Micronesia. Which is taken by a cargo man who had to sell there with some from the other ethnography. It appears near Melanesia and then you get it. Next please. So it's even because it has a lake, okay? A lagoon here in a volcanic island. And the pattern of uh, power suicide or attempted suicide among when the men and women in the same community, very similar to the uh, powers who are taking the name of this. Women, if they want to commit suicide, plant out in the middle of the afternoon in a small dugout canoe, in full view of everybody, after having stopped down the beach and saying, I don't like my parents, give me so unkind to me, now I'm good man to do away with myself, get in the canoe and paddle out. Everybody else who sees us on the beach chases them into the lagoon and drags them back and says, don't be silly, I'll pull yourself together and so on. But men are able to commit suicide. There's the large ocean going canoes and they steal out at night. They pick up the canoes from the, uh, the huts near the entrance to the lagoon and by the time the morning has come, people notice they're missing and the man is gone, and possibly dead, because the islands are so far away from each other. One man in the canoe went to his survive. Next. Next. These are women fishing on the, on the reef, the island which you saw around the lagoon. This is a picture from the name of the first uh, famous uh, historiography in the 1930s, with the thinking man. Next. Cow pictures and modern pictures, taken by a friend of mine. It's a canoe hut, 
Uh, done by C. Next, please. And these are the sort of uh, inside the lagoon canoes, the small canoes. You see people need to move around and swim around to. Not like the big sea gang canoes. So when women go to these little canoes in the afternoon, uh, first heard that the people say, you know, if she does it again, I have a good mind to let her go. It's exactly the same as we say when a girl takes an overdose, I haven't done it completely. We're just sick of them taking overdoses. If she does it again, I, I'm going to leave. I'm not taking the hospital. Can you this, please? What's this? I thought I was going to sit on the So the things only work if there's some sort of threat. This and over this occasionally may kill you. This canoe chair may occasionally end up with them in about drowning. These don't work as adaptive devices. They work because they're dangerous. It's just a newspaper item for somebody to drag back from apparently to themselves off. Yeah. In Boston, in the United yeah. States. Thanks, Peter. And the same again with uh, fathers uh, threatening to kill their children. Or is this something in Norway? No. Uh, is that father dangling his son? It's in Canada. Canada, Vancouver. <sighs> wow. So what a man these days feel disempowered when they get divorced or separated. The woman is normally given custody of the children. The men they often kidnap the children and threaten to harm them unless they have access to the children. The group of men who dress up in Superman costumes mm. must have seen them on the news. Uh, what are they called? Cartoons. Huh? Did you say the man in? Men dress up in Superman costumes to maintain they, they should have custody of their children. They climb up buildings. Yeah, they yeah. Okay. But more commonly, they, they would they kidnap the children without any sort of costume. So as you saw, this is a man who says, if my wife has custody of the baby, I'm going to kill the baby. He's pointing the freaking knife out and hanging the poor baby upside down. Oh. Look, in this case, baby gets rescued uh, by a uh, a Canadian uh, uh, policeman, you see him there uh, holding a quite happy baby. Okay, next one. Now, some English cases. I said some years ago on the English equivalent of that, which I called domestic sieges. The man's friend would divorce from his wife. The wife's the wife now hates him, doesn't want him to have access to John, and is asking the court for a husband to be excluded from childcare. So the husband kidnaps the children, maybe on a, a canoe or visit, the wife leaves the children with him as the court orders. He hangs on to the children and then publicly telephones his wife or the police or social services and says, and says I've now got the kids. So I separate me from my children, I will kill them and then kill myself. So there's one of these standoffs. It can't be pulled in the local television. When I was in Birmingham, I did a study on them, on, uh, about uh, 12 of them. Trying to work on the, those which ended tragically and those which ended, um, nothing to happen. This one. On the whole, they end up safely with the dramatic uh, police reports. So armed police are standing by. Road sealed off as man takes hostage to a house. There seem to be armed police uh, down there. Next one. What it just means say, the man's image when he succeeded. If all goes well, <coughs> she ends in the three stages. So the police are in the house. And there's an old man inside, then the kids. 
name is all kept out of the way. So the negotiation goes on with the police um, interpreter, police spokesman. The door, in, the door open, the front door opens. The children come out. Door shuts. And then the woman police or constable scoops out the children from the front step and covered by the armed police, takes them to safety around the corner. It's a local TV film and all of course. Stage enters again, second stage door opens again, and the gun is thrown out, or a pistol or a knife or whatever. Okay. Door closes. This is it. Stage three, the third stage, is door opens, and the man comes out. A large now saw tragic hero, here is the policeman named his gun at him. He saw a natty costume used by armed Birmingham police for a um, baseball cap and a backup pistol. And uh, he comes out, it's all tragic, you know, somewhere a Western hero. The man who cared so much he was going to kill his job. This one I was saying is interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, witchcraft, the mystery of a woman's death. No, no, no connection. With the Zambia, where she was moved from Shilton. I showed her, and she was. Uh, she shows what good things you get out of the world. She died of witchcraft, and uh, she died in hospital two days. There was no satisfactory explanation for that. That's interesting. Anyway. That's, that's nice. <laughs> there was a case a few uh, months ago yeah? in Manor Park, Newham. Um, where um, a lady believed that she was under the influence of some sort of spiritual possession mm. um, and she had to kill her daughter mm. in the process and she did, she ended up killing her daughter and um, it, she was uh, she was manipulated mm. by this other lady who came to stay at her home um, and she actually pretended to be two people just to make this woman mad apparently and she made her believe that the source of evil in her home was because of this daughter but actually this other person who came and stayed in their house actually fell in love with this woman and just to get her own space she had to get rid of the daughter and the way she did that was by making this woman believe that she was possessed and she believed it wow it was, a, it was a really recent thing. I came here to get involved in the frenzy cases like this. You remember the one two years ago about the man in the hallway who drowned his girlfriend's brother but after accusing him of being a witch, what was the name? Mm. I was part of, I interviewed him in Broadmoor about it. Because the prosecution was trying to get him declared sane. The defence was getting for mental health explanation. I went for the sanity. I said he was quite sane. What was he called? He was a bee. He came from um, Congo. Bukavi. Because some of the names are somewhere like Bukavi. The, the murder was uh, Christmas, on Christmas Day, uh, a few years ago. Case came up about 18 months ago. The guy was found, partly with my evidence, the other people saying the same thing. He was quite sane when he killed the boy, thinking he was a witch. So he got a life imprisonment. This is probably better than going to Bournemouth. If you're wondering if you're accused of murder, then go for the sane defence. Go to prison, you'll be out in about eight years. Go to Broadmoor and still be there 30 years later. So much better as so my um, support of the prosecution, he was quite sane when he did it, was actually in his own interests. It might seem that to get people off as being meant to uh, is probably good like them. And what happens of course with uh, shoplifting? Mm. Seeing shoplifting which seems a very innocuous thing here's a woman accused of shoplifting and killed herself. So there has to be some sanction in these patterns. Next one. An agrophobia is related to some the real affairs. The women of agrophobia are not generally the victims of previous uh, stalking or anything else. 
It's more diffuse sort of fair. Next. Uh, okay, next one. We're nearly there. Look at this in scratch all the times. Well, something like this. The issue with cultures in nature is the same as that of male to female, same as that of the passive cognition to affect and dot to the patient. There's the relationship is constant the whole time. I'm not saying all daughters are, are male or all patients are female. The relationship of male to female is the same with daughter to patient. If you're a male patient in the hospital, you can flirt with your nurse. You can hardly flirt with your doctor. It's not surgically possible. So the more complicated diagram well, I have a born nurse and it becomes a triangle. That doesn't get terribly busy. Uh, as soon as you add public to private, men's words to public world, women's words to domestic work, Men supposedly produce, women supposedly consume, men desire, women need, and so on. So obviously, this is what's called a polythetic classification, which in relationship is always constant. And of course, we work at social, cultural relations, not actuality. So you can map all the patterns I've talked about on a sort of grid like this next one, please. Which I do here, can we? Back uh, to the yeah. Oh, that is the guy. Right. You may to me later. So I've done, I've done all on the left hand side. I've done the culture balance and the characteristics. Mm -hmm. And along the horizontal line, I've done the western patterns, which is the constitute culture balance syndromes. And some would seem to fit the verbal pan and do others. So menopause is there? Sorry? Menopause. Menopause. Or things that are possibly social patterns. And some antibodies have argued that menopause is a social pattern. One that fits best is over those. It's so all positive, it's so all wrong here. Can you tell Shop us more about this? Can you, what do I have going like? Can you tell us more about that? I've never heard this before, about menopause being social bound. Can you tell us more? I thought it was something that just happens. But yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean? The social well, bound? It's one well largely done by um, an English laboratory technician. She went off to Canada, became a medical anthropologist. Margaret de Rock, okay? okay. Probably one of the most famous Canadian medical anthropologists. Why do menopausal symptoms don't occur in Japan? Or okay. well, when their periods stop, wouldn't feel fear, they're more energetic, and no headaches, they leave them the burden of working after children and husbands. So I say it's an uplift. So there are symptoms in the way, but they're positive symptoms, yeah, not depression. So the wrong box she argues that uh, menopause is not culturally recognized in Japan. They then they then biologize that part of, of woman's life. So I saw that in I think it doesn't fit very well. And transsexism at the end doesn't fit at all. But probably all those on the left fit very well. we still can go and shop for it. Hmm. Baby snatch is an interesting one. Hmm. Happens about every fifteen years. It disappears and suddenly there's a brief epidemic of it and then it goes away again. Oh. The epidemic about six years ago, and before that, 50 years before that. In England, you used to leave your baby in a pram outside the shop, and you go in and do your shopping. Not anymore. This is a, after the first episode of, of Baby Statue, which the stereotype was one who's um, lost her baby, I want to have a baby and the boyfriend didn't want a baby and she snatches the baby and works off it very well but it does kidnap it and normally gives it up after a few days and nothing bad happens in these cases. So that fits the pattern favour, shoplifting, on a neurotic sort, agoraphobia fits, 
domestic seizures fears. What's domestic seizures? Sorry? What is domestic seizures? Domestic seizures. No, the one I just talked about, the man taking the, the baby and... So domestic seizures is also baby snatching? Is also? Baby snatching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the different sort. Uh, baby snatching is a woman taking the baby to walk after it. To then she imagines it's her baby. Domestic seizures is where the male object to having his children taken away and threatening to kill them. Mm -hmm. So on the surface, they seem to be very different. But it's a good point you made, and then thought of putting the two together. They are quite similar. So each gender follows its supposed gender role. Woman's a nurturant, man's aggressive and so on. Mm -hmm. The question is to... Uh, so, on the hands we move over, the fifth is the rest of them. So, not came the so-called Norway sees our culture man synonyms, but some of them it seems to be a fair fit. Now, who's this lady? If you get it right, I'll give a buy you a cup of coffee. But then they never guess this. You can guess. What? Can you guess? I'm asking them, can you guess? A what? In data, okay. Maybe that will help you. I'm not helping you. Date 1926 or better about? What sort of things were happening in 1926? Charming skin. Women in a sort of charm for the sash. Okay, save the coffee. It's the first Miss World. No, really? Wow. Wow. No, we were saying, well, I'm the half of it because of the range between the knees and the ankles. That's now so unfashionable. We won the golden the legs. Uh, next one, please. This is what is more appropriate these days. And so we want to shape like that. Now imagine all those as well in this world, but not the lady before. Just because fashions have changed, we want the longer legged women. And our uh, male tasted women have probably got more paedophiliac. Mm. So we want girls to look like babies, large eyes, large mouths. <laughs> and the future, next on the future. Oh wow, no. This is my no. predictions in no, no. the future. I'd be so <laughs> Change system. Okay. Hi. Just so I'm eating the sauce. Is I think from the sun. So there's a dieting competition. And there are three figures on it. The bottom we've got Fatty, who is the woman involved before she entered the competition. And she's chubby, dumpy, fat, and so on. The idea of the competition is you should try to like the Princess of Wales, this uh, we found the top right hand corner, okay? And one on the left is fatty after she won the competition, so she's now slim. And has become very only in single the princess. This is powerful because we know the, uh, the princess started didn't have an eating disorder and she attempted suicide to beat the birthday herself down the stairs. So it works. You lose enough weight to eat to become a princess. Or you have to stop eating and bang a princess. <laughs> I don't feel too much. <laughs> nah. That's a social fantasy. Okay. Fixed one. Oh. Uh, let's just start releasing out the next six to 
obviously lost too much. I know why I have that side. In. Next one. Okay. Now the blue line, the horizontal line, is the BMI cutoff point for under nutrition, okay? Mm. Which you see is about BMI of eighteen and a half kilograms per square meter, okay? The red line going across it mm. on wins the Miss America competition. As you see, it getting thinner and thinner. So about 1975, they cross over the line into pathology. Mm. So these days, you see, we can't become uh, Miss America and they're so malnourished. And so our lady in 1926, we went yeah. out there. On the left hand side. We were all rather unkindly sneering at her for being too fast. Here this one. And our real old concerns on women for being too fat. The famous strike in American Airlines about um, five years ago when the airline decided that women had to be less than a certain weight when all went on strike and more one won the thing in the end. Okay, here's another example, it's uh, multiple personalities all this from the film Three Faces of Eve. We could argue multiple personalities all it's just the spirit possession of the West. So the same mechanism. Same thing. But just it doesn't have exclusive external spirits, has uh, avatars of the same individual. I did mention it in my um support screen but I go to a small um, monograph on uh multiple personalities and so on compared to this video. There's a famous film Three Faces of Eve, must be in about nineteen sixty. Definitely the multiple personalities all started about ten years ago. Now more has faded away as these things are very fashionable. Started in America, uh, which started American psychotherapists said you need to realize all your personalities. Well sort of happened was um I or knowing psychiatrist would um uh, see a patient who would say the doctor, I'm so upset, I, I can't really adjust myself. I feel there are many different me's within me. The me that wants to be faithful to my husband. The me that wants to take drugs, go out there and be promiscuous, dance away the night and have a wild time. I can't ever talk about my baby. Tell me which is the real me. And then the and I say to her, well, both these are the real you. Just in different moods, uh, you want to do both things. Either way, I find them out, or I combine them, or find some middle way through that. What well, did America at the same time? The same woman presented the game. The therapist would say, Oh, the different use are there. That's very interesting. Tell me their different names. So, it was exaggerating the difference between them. The experiment I do with my students at UCL is to imagine their two use. The two of you. It's incredibly easy to do. And the opposition is normally based on very standardised characteristics. The good view and the bad view, the view the ones who enjoy themselves, a view the ones who be look after other people, and nurture to you and statistic you and so on. So we generally follow for standard standardised characteristics. We can spread possession costs. It just says standardized, we've got different named spirits is for their personality. For us in the less uh, prescriptive world, spirits have to be uh, manifestations of ourselves. The more it can be similar to each other. I think the last one. <coughs> 
This is where we have to be. Mm. How can men uh, avert themselves of the problems of women? Mm. Or the using illnesses uh, are negotiated strategy that the women do women do have access to and the costs are being seen as unfair. Yeah. Well they can only do that by becoming women, which of course is now more possible. Uh, this is the first uh, English transsexual. Yeah. So if we want women's uh, access to women's strategies we have to become well or do we? Obviously men can develop our women's disorders, men take overdoses of course. So I tend to send them out the exits and our male. So male is in the sudden situation you can be you can be more like females. Same as the Moroccan case I gave you of the man who had uh, Brazil and had a uh, female children. 